Welcome to Therapist Uncensored, a podcast where therapists freely speak their minds about real life matters. We are so excited for two reasons for today's episode. First of all, we are very happy and appreciative that we have our former co-host, Patty Allwell, on the show today, and very grateful that she's here and that she's brought us an amazing interview with our guest today, Esther Perel. Esther Perel has been noted by New York Times as the most important game changer in sexuality and relational health since Dr. Ruth. So that is saying a great deal. She has just released a new book called The State of Affairs, Rethinking Infidelity. You will find out today in today's episode how she helps us rethink the concepts of sexuality, desire, infidelity in our culture and in our lives. So I think she brings such a refreshing and important voice. And obviously many people think that she has recently also produced an Audible series, which is entitled, Where Should We Begin? And that is live and unscripted real therapy couple sessions that she does on a podcast. So we have found ourselves referring many people to those sessions because it's just an invigorating way to get a behind the scenes look at what happens when couples go deep and do work on really important and difficult matters. So we're very excited to have her on our show today and think you will really come away with some very, very deep insights. So let me turn it over to Patty. So you've spent almost 30 years studying love and desire. Could you tell our listeners what drew you to this subject? So maybe just to give a bit of a, a clinical uh, trajectory, I was trained originally in psychodynamic psychotherapy. I had a degree in expressive arts therapies. I was very interested in the integration of the different artistic modalities into the therapeutic process. And then I stumbled upon the Cambridge Family Institute and I began years of training in systemic family therapy. I spent many years uh, studying with Salvador Mnuchin and with Peggy Papp. And I was doing families, I was doing systems, but couples was not so central at the time because couples therapy at that time was primarily in a way, you know, the family came for things related to the children and we were there to say, maybe there's some things going on between the two of you and your child is carrying the stress of that. Gradually, as the couple became more central to the survival of the family, because nothing today keeps a family together except for the, the emotional connection, the quality of the connection between the partners, couples entered more and more asking help for themselves. And originally, my first work with couples was primarily working with mixed couples, interracial, interreligious, interfaith couples, and intercultural couples. I, I was cross-cultural psychologist that was interested in looking at how big cultural changes influence gender relations and child rearing practices. And I didn't deal with sexuality. I dealt with relationships, and particularly across the religious and the cultural divisions, if you want. But I didn't want to write a book about intermarriage. And we were in the late 90s, and, uh, and there was the Clinton scandal, and I wrote an article for the networker, for the psychotherapy networker, in search of erotic intelligence, in which I talked about some of my observations about American sexuality, and about this very interesting moment, you know, of sexual politics, where in this country, divorce was often highly accepted, and much more tolerated, but transgression was not. And the rest of the world, in order to preserve the families, had always opted the other way around. The compromise was made towards the infidelity in order to preserve the family. And I just thought that was so culturally different. And I wrote this article, and this article turned into mating in captivity. And without knowing it, I started to study sexuality and I began to devour voraciously, you know, whatever I could learn about sexology and became also a sex therapist, which I don't really practice, but I integrated sexuality as part of couples therapy. And like everything else that you learn when you didn't do it before, you wonder, how could I do therapy without knowing anything about that? 
Exactly. You know, how, how can I work with couples and not ask and not know what to do around sexuality? I mean, how can you know? So today, I you know, if I was in Europe, they call it psychosexual therapy. You know, it is the integration of relationship and sexuality therapy into one. So that's kind of how this thing progressed. But it wasn't a choice; it happened to me, and then I took it and I went with it. Exactly. That's wonderful. Well, and your latest research has really been about infidelity. I think you've been working 10 years on this book that's coming out. And I'm curious how you would define cheating today. Is it only sex with another partner? Or is it porn? Or is it the emotional connection? Is it sexting? Interesting thing, of course, is the choice of the vocabulary itself, right? When I worked on, and to call it cheating, when I worked on mating in captivity, I really explored the dilemmas of desire in modern relationships today. And in some way, when I look at my work on infidelity, which indeed started in 2009, the book I only began writing two years ago, but the the research, um, it was really looking at what happens when desire goes looking elsewhere. So I did look at infidelity from the lens, in terms of the motivation, in terms through the lens of desire, not through the lens of sex. So then I looked at what are some of the ways one can define it. And I would say that infidelity is often made up of three elements. The constitutive element is the secret. The fact that there is no infidelity without a secret. It, it's not what people do. It's the fact that it is a secret that they're doing it. That central element of the secret is the number one. And then the second element is a certain emotional involvement to one degree or another. Even hit and run has a certain emotional involvement. It takes a lot of emotional effort to make something be totally emotionally irrelevant, you know, if you look at it from that side. And the third element is the sexual aura. And the aura is much more significant to me. It's an energy. You can have an entire experience without ever having touched someone. And that's where the the digital comes in. You know, the kiss that you only imagine giving online gives you the full experience as if you just had it. And this Proust said it as well. It is the imagination that is responsible and not, not the other person. So affairs are acts of the imagination, but they are always, it's always a dual perspective. The, at the heart of infidelity is betrayal and hurt and deception and lies. And affairs are also about longing and loss and self-seeking. So it's always what it did to the other and what it meant for me. And these two stories live side by side, two very differentiated experiences. The motivations right. for doing it and the impact of it on the partner and on the relationship and, and on the whole system, for that matter. Affairs are systemic. They're not stories of two people. I read in your book that you talk about stages in treating affairs and talking about affairs with couples. And my own experience is that first you have to f- deal with the hurt, that that has to be the focus first of the person who feels betrayed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that your experience? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much. But if I may, you asked me before about the definition as well. I think that when you people say cheating, the first question you ask is, what is cheating? Where does cheating begin for you? How do you define it? And we know that the definition of infidelity today keeps on expanding. And we know that the digital has made available a host of new illicit encounters. And so is it staying active on your dating app? Is it sexting? Is it chatting? Is it porn watching? Is it the massage with happy endings? Is it reconnecting with your exes on Facebook? I mean, where do we draw the lines these days? Is a conversation that couples really need to have very early on in their relationships. And unfortunately, the majority of couples only have those conversations after they are in the crisis. So we do need, and every research paper ends generally with a line that says we need more research in order to define what is infidelity. So I decided to do a more ethnographic take where I would actually ask the people to define it for me, you know, from a phenomenological point of view, what is it, what does it represent for you? What is the meaning of it? Um, Not just what are the facts of it. 
So when I worked in the immediate aftermath of the revelation of an affair, in the crisis phase, people are in a, often in a total state of upheaval. They have lost their sense of predictable future. They often feel that they have lost their sense of identity. They haven't just lost the other, they have lost their sense of self. They knew that they could, they, that they didn't know what the future would be, but they thought that they knew what the past was. And to, and they lose the coherence of the narrative of their life. And they are besieged by a host of contradictory emotions. It's love me, it's hold me, it's leave, it's get the hell out, it's touch me, it's don't touch me, it's I hate you, it's back and forth of contradictory feelings that are superimposing each other one after the other very, very fast. And it's extremely important to normalize the maelstrom and to normalize all these elements of the crisis that I just described. And the loss of identity is often on both sides. The person who finally is, is revealed it sometimes also wonders, what was I doing? Who was I? How did I get there? What happened to me? I mean, it's both people. And the therapist's role in that phase is to really provide structure and calmness and a safe space to hold this intense experience, to maybe help people not make decisions because they are so caught and hostage to their limbic systems in that moment that there is no decisions to be made, and also to separate the feelings about the affair with the feelings about the marriage. And the hurt is all of that. And the partner who has been discovered, their role at this moment is to be able to hear the hurt, to acknowledge it, to show the remorse and to show the guilt for hurting their partner. Even if they don't feel guilty for the experience of the affair itself, they may think that they have just went through one of the most powerful things in their life. But that doesn't mean that it didn't hurt the other person. And the ability to acknowledge and to hold that remorse is extremely important. We know from trauma that the most important thing is to have the, the person who inflicted the pain on you to be able to recognize that that happened. That is the number one. And then the number two is to understand that you're going to come back with the same questions over and over again. That this obsessiveness, that this need to piece back together the pieces of your reality is going to make you ask the question 10 times and that you're not doing this just to annoy the other. That you're doing this because you're trying to find your coherence back. And, um, right. and you tell the person, you're going to need to answer this again and again and again, because this is the way this happened. This is the nature of this piece. And then you help the other people to deal with the hurt by asking more investigative questions rather than detective questions. Questions that help you understand, that help you make sense, that help you make meaning of this. Not questions that keep you awake at night by mining the sordid details of what happened there. There's always going to be more. You're never going to know the whole thing. And when people say, but I need to know in order to trust. No, trust, you know, trust is the ability to, to deal with the unknown. <laughs> it is a leap of faith. You should trust that there's more than you will know. But you, there's a few basic things you need answers for. And you need answers that help you find a place for this thing in your life. So that this doesn't become the central event of your whole life. And doesn't erase everything that you've been together sometimes for 25 years before. I often see my role as slowing the person down. Because once you get those answers that you think you want, and you see the pictures, and you hear the text, and the phone calls, you can't unsee it. You can't unhear it. And so it's really part of my role to slow them down. Absolutely. You know, when someone asks a question, one of the very important things a therapist can do is to say, do you want an answer to your question or do you want your partner to know that you have this question? Mm, Meaning like you that. want your partner to know that you're thinking about this. You're dying to find out, but you're not going to ask because for your own self-protection, it isn't a good idea. So I stop them and I just say, do you want your partner to answer these questions? Do you really want to know or do you want your partner to know that that's what you're thinking about? And you have the question, but you don't need the answer. It's very good slowing down. Are there specific kinds of couples or couples with specific characteristics that survive affairs and maybe even thrive after them? Are there things you've identified that you sort of say couples who do X or who are X 
tend to do better? It's very interesting. Yesterday, I was listening to one of the, the podcast sessions of a couple um, in Where Should We Begin? And what, was, what really stood out when I was listening to the session is that she's upset. He's the person who, who strayed. She's wondering, can she ever come back to him? Can she ever trust him again? And in the midst of this, she's also able to talk about how a wonderful father he's been, how they've been able to parent beautifully together, how they were there for each other in ways that both of them come from very, very troubled backgrounds. And he too, he was able to say in the midst of everything else, things that are about her as a human being, her as a mother, her as the daughter to her parents, her as the kind of person that she is. And I thought that ability to still see the person as bigger than only this act and to still be able to say good things about the person despite all what has happened. The ability to still have empathy for other things that the person has struggled with in their life. This is a major indicator. It's that a, makes total it's sense. It's a more subtle one. It's not something you go look for. But whenever you see that people are still able to relate to the human being as a full person beyond this acute crisis, and especially when they talk about their families and their past, and their, instead of saying, this is that why this happened, because it's exactly what your father did. But instead to say, you know, she was the one who had to take care of her, her whole family. You know, the father had to be brought back to his own country because he was total alcoholic and he couldn't even stay here. And she took care of everything. That ability to empathize with the other in the midst of this is a very, very strong curative sign. You always look for buffers and magnifiers. This is a good buffer. Mm-hmm. You know, the, that in, in health, we look at what are the buffers and the magnifiers to, to, to our sense of health. This is a buffer. So this is one. The other one is the couples who are able in the immediate aftermath, or not immediate, in the aftermath of affairs, to have conversations with a level of depth and openness and honesty that they haven't had in years. The couples that are able to also say, this wasn't about you. This has nothing to do with you. This was me. You know, you didn't do anything. Or the other person saying, look, I don't take responsibility for this, for you doing this. But I, there are certain things in our relationship that I think I need to take responsibility for. And that level of accountability on both parts. The couples that right. are able to reconnect sexually, I think it's very important. It's the opposite of I would like to, but I can't because if I do, then I, so if I let you get away with murder and I, I don't want to give you that satisfaction. The couples that are able to say, what are we going to learn from this? What is this telling us? Or how do we turn this crisis into an opportunity? And into an opportunity to have an even stronger relationship with each other. And to say, this is terrible, but we can do something good with this. Of course, did it have to happen? No, we wish it didn't have to happen this way. And the couples who are able to say, you know, I didn't want to listen. I didn't hear you. I didn't take you seriously. I thought I could, I could stall a little longer. And then, and then I was saying, okay, I got the message. I see what you're saying now. I mean, it's levels of acknowledgement of things that, because people often say, you know, you should have talked about it before. As if people didn't talk to their partners, if they didn't try to say some things for years, but the partner wasn't right. listening for a host of reasons, you know. And people who are really able to be less into blame and more into understanding and um, all of these things are real indicators of couples for whom this will be a crisis that they will have weathered like other crises. And when I went back to interview people five, ten years later, you could really see those for whom this became one very critical event in their history and those for whom this remains a central event of their relationship. So then you say, okay, both of these kinds of people stayed together. But for one, it became a real opportunity to turn this into something useful. And in, for the other, it became swallowing poison and waiting for the other person to die. So the goal is not oh. just for people to stay together. The point is for people to reconnect with a sense of aliveness and vitality in their relationship. To rebuild. Right. So to really know, thrive yes. in the relationship. Not just to not yeah. be dead. That's not enough. Yes, which is a theme you have talked about since early in Mating in Captivity when you talked about 
the community you grew up in and how that really formed you, that you found people who came through adversity. Do you want to tell our listeners a little about that? So when I wrote Mating, it became very clear to me that my work was very much about eroticism and very little about sexuality, actually. And that eroticism, I looked at it in the mystical sense of the word, not the way modernity has narrowed it to just a sexual meaning. It's the quality of aliveness, of vibrancy, of vitality, the ability to renew, the antidote to death, the life force, in that sense. And I began to notice that, in fact, the meaning of that word for me came from my background. I am a child of Holocaust survivors of two parents who spent five years in, in labor camps and in concentration camps and who lost their entire family, who then were illegal refugees in Belgium for many years to follow. And I did grow up in a community all of survivors that was often divided between those who did not die and those who came back to life. That's the way I defined it. And the people who didn't die, who remained deeply affected by the traumas they had experienced, who were morbid, who couldn't experience any sense of pleasure, because if you are experiencing pleasure, then you're not being vigilant. And if you're not being vigilant, then bad things can happen. And so they lived very tethered to the ground, and they didn't trust anyone, and they were not dead. And so were their children. They, could not ex- they couldn't thrive, because when you thrive, you take risks. Because if you drive, you, you embrace change you as well, not only, but as well. Because when, you know, it's safety and sexuality and pleasure. So the other group were people who I described as the ones who came back to life because they understood the erotic as an antidote to death. They knew how to maintain a sense of aliveness, how to rebuild, how to, to reconnect with life, to play again, to be creative again, to take risks again to have an active engagement with the unknown, which is what trauma often blocks for us. And I think it's the same in couples. There are couples that are not dead and there are couples that are alive. And my work has often been, given that I believe that it's the quality of our relations that determines the quality of our life. I want to imagine a world where people can experience that sense of aliveness and vitality in their relationships and not just through affairs. Because that is the central word that they will use when I ask them to describe what the affair means to them, for the strayers. And it just struck me how consistent that theme of, you know, surviving versus thriving has been through all your work. Surviving versus thriving, yeah. yes, yes. And because I believe that, you know, the essence of the erotic is, is your imagination, it's your curiosity. And curiosity is entering into unknown places. That means you have to be willing to take risks. That means that you have to define trust as an active engagement with the unknown. (laughs) But trust comes from the risk-taking and not the other way around. And those are two very different theories of trust that people are dealing with these days. So we need both. We really need both. We need home and we need journey and travel. We need security and we need adventure. Basically, and I've continued with those themes, which were very influenced by the readings also of Stephen Mitchell, Can Love Last, and that I then adapted in a more systemic way to couples. So there are many people that are part of the development of my thinking, my theories, and now backed by quite a bit of new research, actually. So was there anything you found in your research that really surprised you? No, what surprises me is when I come up with an observation, because I've always said I am absolutely sure of nothing and I'm never right, but I can only assure you that I didn't make it up. So I would observe things. And my my data was primarily uh, ethnographic and clinical. But then there are a number of people doing PhDs and doing serious research on some of these ideas. And then when I get the evidence base, you know, then, then I feel like, oh, what I observe actually is, has a scientific base to it and is confirmed. Right. Then I feel like it's no longer just, uh, not that just is a bad, is, is, is minimizes it, but it goes beyond the observation. Now it's, it, you know, it's systemically confirmed. And that I find gives a whole different heft because otherwise you, you really have to continue to say, this is my observation. There's no way for me to prove it. But I can only tell you this is 
many, many years of listening to this. I interestingly just did a, an analysis yesterday with Rich Simon from The Networker. We took one of the episodes from the podcast and we analyzed it for three hours. It's a, it's a 40 minute session. What I did there, step, step, and what the work on the erotic blocks in this couple who were both survivors of sexual abuse and the whole thing. And I think I've never broken my thinking down in detail so, so finely as I did in that episode yesterday. So at some point that will be available as well. What other things do I, have I found? That notion, you know, that the real importance of thinking around the dual perspective around infidelity to me has been very, very important. To understand that it's a, it's a both ends, that the combination... It's not just the impact on the marriage, no. it's also the impact on the self of, of both of them. And it's the existential dilemmas of love and desire as well. You know, when you look at the subject of infidelity in the art, it isn't only described as betrayal or as trauma. It is also described as a love story. It is also yeah. described as a, as an, as a discovery of, of the self. It is also described as a longing for lost parts of oneself. It has an existential narrative as well. In, at this point in our field, in the last 15 years, Michelle Shankman has really written this up very nicely, how the word trauma has entered the language of infidelity as the organizing language. But it is one piece of it. It isn't the whole story of it. And so to realize how complex it was. I, you know, one discovery for me has been asking thousands of people if they have been affected by infidelity and coming up with an average number of 80% of the population will tell you that they have been affected by infidelity in one way or another, as the children of, as the, you know, it's not just as the people in the triangle. And this common experience is so common and so poorly understood. So that, I think a, a basic discovery for me for years, there were two actually very critical ones. For many years, I was taught that sexual problems are the consequence of relationship problems. And what you need to do is work on the relationship, improve the intimacy, the connection, the communication, the trust, and the sex will follow. And I began to be very clear that many couples improved dramatically, but it did nothing in the bedroom. And so this beginning the understanding that love and desire relate, but they also conflict, that was a major paradigm shift for me. And that people would come right. in and say, we love each other very much, we have no sex. And now people come in and say, I love my partner very much, I'm having an affair. The fact that people can cheat even in happy marriages, the fact that affairs are not just symptoms of relationships gone awry or symptoms of something wrong in the couple or something wrong in the person and that you can't just pathologize it away because millions of people can't all be pathological. Those are very challenging ideas. They really force you to rethink and to reposition something that you had begun to just look through one lens only. And, you know, once I write it, it's years after my own challenges have been processed. It's not like I started there myself. Well, you know, that sort of idea of one lens reminds me of your chapter on sex addiction and sort of how it's the medicalization of affairs. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that for the listeners. Yeah. You know, I think one of the most influential lines that I heard from one of the women in my office one day was, you need a diagnosis now? You can't just be an asshole anymore? You can't just be a pig, actually, <laughs> is what she said. And I just thought, a good dose of healthy rage, you know? So we know that there is a big debate going on about the diagnosis itself of sexual addiction. We know that there are people who have out-of-control sexualities. I prefer the model of Doug Brown Harvey. I think it's a much more holistic way of thinking about sexual addiction because it includes a model of sexual health. Uh, you cannot right. talk about what's sick if you don't know what is healthy. And the addiction model does often not include the concept of sexual health and what, what is involved in it. And one of the very interesting findings, by the way, around sexual health, and I use the definition of the World Health Organization, is that the CDC in the last three years has taken the word pleasure out of the definition of sexual health. And that is very, very interesting and I would say even problematic. So 
there are people who struggle with their sexuality. There are people who are hypersexual or who have compulsion, no doubt. And they need help. But not every person who strays and who strays even repeatedly has an addiction. They may be narcissistic. And as part of their narcissism, they treat people in a certain way. That doesn't make them out of control as You know, there's a difference between being out of control and feeling out of control. And we know that when we work with domestic violence. So why not apply it here? And I also wonder if the 12-step model, with all the emphasis on the person who had the affair, and he gets a spon- it's usually men that are diagnosed with sexual addiction, but he gets a sponsor and he's going to meetings and there's all this support for him. And it, in, way, in a way, it sort of starves the relationship and the person who's not diagnosed as the addict. Because it's like instead of working on the two together, you're isolating one part of the relationship. But that is a very big clinical conversation that we have had around uh, substance abuse in general. Do you work with the alcoholic separately? Do you create, do you do couples therapy? Do you, how long does the person need to be sober? I mean, we have had questions about what is the value of seeing people separately and the value of seeing people together for a long time. And I don't know that there are definitive answers about this. I think that, that it's very useful and very helpful to be in a 12-step community, no doubt. First and foremost, because there is a community and there are other people who have struggled with some of the same things or variations on the theme. And that communal experience is the most important thing because people who are in the grip of something often are isolated. And so first and foremost, the 12-step groups are groups that take people out of that isolation and offer ongoing support and take people out of the silence, the secrecy, and the shame. So... To me, that's the value more than anything else. The paradigm that they use, uh, you know, I can come in and say, look, I know what they're telling you there. I'm going to tell you something else. And you're going to see how you can integrate those two different uh, entry points. It's the same thing as, you know, should we encourage couples to reconnect sexually with each other in the aftermath of the revelation of an affair? So there are some clinicians who believe that absolutely not. There are some clinicians who believe that you need to do logs and letter writings where you detail all the hotels and every act of transgression and everything that you have done and that you submit that to your partner. To me, this is meant to re-traumatize people. I don't see the value of these things. I think that there are letters that need to be written, but they may be love letters. They may be letters that really say, I fucked up. There may be letters that say, I owe you something. I need you to know why I want to be here. You know, there are other kinds of letters that are, to my mind, more helpful in the rebuilding and in the repairing, in two words. And I think that the reconnecting is important because people need to feel that they can enjoy together again. They can be close again. And so there are very different kind of points of view here, and I think they need to coexist. There isn't, I don't know that any one of us is more right than the other. If people come in and they say, I have a sex addiction, then I say, you have a problem. You have a problem. That doesn't yet mean that you have a pathology. But I don't discuss with them the value of the word. What I want to discuss with them is the value with which it, for some people, becomes an excuse, and then we have a problem. Or for some people, it becomes a framework in which to understand something, and it becomes a redemptive framework, because it means you're not bad. You're sick. That's okay. That's okay. But in any case, we have been medicalizing sexuality for a long time now. We're doing it with all kinds of pills. So this is part of a larger shift where sexuality shifted from religion to medicine as the holders of the truth. It kind of reminds me, I saw you interviewing with Dan Savage Mm -hmm. at Google, and the subject of sex ed in the U.S. came up, and you were very passionate And I think you made the statement that in the U.S., a lot of times the only sex ed people get is from porn. And maybe you'd like to expand on that a little bit. Look, I'm from Belgium, from the Flemish part of Belgium. And we're not as good as the Dutch, but we are close. And I come from countries that, that teach sexual health. 
and they teach it not just and sexual health is not just the absence of disease or the absence of dysfunction of the absence of dangers it's about rights it's about pleasure it's about dignity and we teach it from age four as part of our overall health education so millions of dollars have been spent on abstinence campaigns and we know that the U.S. has an earlier onset of sexual activity two years before the liberal Dutch. We know that there is more STD, and we know that there is more teen pregnancy than all of the EU and 30 other developing countries combined. This is the only industrialized nation that does not have a public health policy on adolescent sexuality. I can't see this do good. I'm sorry. I think that that leaves a major vacuum. And so when we are all screaming at the negative effects of porn on the 11-year-old brain, we have a responsibility as educators, as parents, as a nation to do better. And that will be the way that we will, that we will stand up against the pornified society. We're not doing it. We just cry against porn. We say porn is bad, and we're not looking at what we're not doing. And that is not just education about sex. It's education about relationships. It's education about connection, about responsibility, and especially in the digital age. It's education about emotional intelligence and empathy. All of this goes together with sexuality. Sexuality just doesn't just stand out there, and it's not a plumbing mess. And that integration is sorely missing in the U.S., and with terrible consequences. We talk about consent. We talk about what happens on college campus, and we don't talk about what all the vacuum that we have left for the 10 years preceding. So yes, I'm passionate about that because I have two boys and I thought they deserve better. Yeah. All of our children. My, my youngest son was in public school in New York City. He got two hours of education about this subject. Two people. One said, if you have sex, you have AIDS. And the other person said, I had sex and I have HIV positive. Wow. And I thought... This is very stunning. And this is a very, you know, good public school in New York City. Middle school. I just don't think that's okay. I agree with you. I'm in the state of Texas, which is very conservative about sex ed, and I'm in a college town, so a lot of my clients are young, and it's sort of stunning how many both men and women you know, have the exp- their first experiences with sex are straight out of a porn movie, and it's like no right. foreplay, no focus on on pleasure, no idea of what how to really give women pleasure. It's it's stunning. I mean, we can go into the whole hookup scene about that, and and how the quality of the experience for women is deteriorating. The the fear always is that if you teach about sexuality, you're going to make young people seek out sex. sex. And I really want it to be very clear, this is an integrated education. You teach about well-being. You teach about responsibility. You know, in the U.S., sex is the risk factor. In Europe, being irresponsible is the risk factor. Sex is natural and a part of human development. That's the fundamental difference of the kind of education that we get. And I think the U.S. can do better. I agree with you wholeheartedly. So this podcast, we have people downloading it in over 120 countries. So is there any sort of message to people outside the U.S. or observations that you'd like to share with the audience? So... Yes, actually, I would like to tell you about a a digital platform that I created called Session, in which I wanted to create something that I think is often missing, which is an educational salon for therapists, for life coaches, that is multidisciplinary, inclusive, and multicultural. I speak nine languages, I travel the globe, and it's very important for me that we integrate these cultural differences in our conversations about relationships, about power, about gender, and about sexuality, about love, lust, and commitment, the whole range. I invite all the people that I have learned from, instead of creating my own institute and my own school, I wanted people to really have a chance to listen 
to the breadth of voices out there because too often these days we have clinical chapels and we have echo chambers and we are less and less in conversation with those who think and work differently from us. It is true in politics and it is true in our own field as well, worldwide. And we know that social media has had a great deal to do with that. So that has been my, my passion, actually, in the last year. It's been to create this platform where people are, you know, in dozens of countries at this moment also participating in conversation because we are more and more treating people globally. The problems are not that different. Um, wherever romanticism has entered. The problem are not that different in terms of sexual health. The problem are not, you know, the, the context is different. And so it's a combination of clinical thinking in, in unique context. And for our listeners, we'll get the information on how you can find yeah, that as well as all... Sessions with a fair parent, you know. I mean, it's all on the website, but I think me, myself, I was trained in, as a, when I was trained in systemic family therapy, it in a way was the chapel of that time. Had I been younger and come later, I would have probably caught on with the neuroscience movement. I would have caught on with the EFT movement. I would have caught on with ADP. You know, that I highly think that one of the greatest things I've done is to be part of a peer group where we had five people from five completely different schools. EFT, ADP, CBT, myself. And to not stay in the churches. I think that is one of the things that is making our field less rich and less diverse and less thriving than it could be. And um, I just want to make sure when you say in one of the churches, you mean not be dogmatic about the theoretical yes, orientation. Yes, one modality for everybody. You know, it's to really stay open and curious about completely different ways of thinking and collaborate with people. Treat, you know, I see a certain couples together with therapists that do completely different work. Diana Sosha and I collaborate together. George Soller and I from ESC collaborate together. We see the same client. And it's very rich because none of us can give everything to one client or to one couple. And to not be threatened by that, but to actually see, I work extensively with Heidi Schleifer, who I bring into my office to work with a couple while I watch. I mean, it goes on and on. I, I think that I wasn't trained this way, and I stumbled upon it, and I actually think that it has become one of the richest forms of training for me, as well as for other people, other clinicians out there. So that's one thing that I want to bring. And I think the second thing I would say, psychologists, psychotherapists, we have often not spoken in the public sphere. We have left it to other people to describe what goes on in society. And yet we have such a very front row seat view of what people are struggling with. And I think we have to re-enter the public square. You know, the wise person used to sit in the middle of the square, not in a small office with four walls. And I would like to encourage therapists to become more vocal about, you know, Bill Doherty is doing extraordinary work around that, about citizen therapists, you know, and, and in the political sphere, to not stay recluse. In, in our offices or in, or in our clinics, for that matter. We have a lot to say and to offer to the complexities of the, of the lives that people live, and we are not heard nearly enough. Yeah, and I think, unfortunately, historically, we've worked on helping people adjust to an unjust world, and I think there's more to be done than that. I agree. I mean, to me, that. Those are the, the big messages, you know. There is no ideal society. Nobody has figured out what, where the better relationships exist. What we know is that they are very challenging today. The rule book is changing rapidly and we are reinventing it on a daily basis. And dogma isn't going to help us. What will help us is our ability to accompany open-mindedly and flexibly the clients that we see. And when it comes to the kinds of topics that I grapple with, they demand very non-judgmental responses. They demand our ability to check our counter-transference because every other subject, not everybody has had an experience with. When you work with sexuality, there isn't a human being that doesn't have an experience with, with sexuality. So every therapist comes with an experience on the topic. And we need to modulate our reactions, our counter-transference with the kinds of issues that our clients bring to us. 
You guys, when you were talking at Google, you and Dan Savage were also having a really interesting discussion about exclusivity and monogamy in relationships. And Dan Savage was talking about serial monogamy Mm -hmm. and how he was often insulted that people were judging his relationship because he had more of a commitment to his partner Mm -hmm. than to exclusivity or monogamy. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you had, you know, speaking about checking our counter-transference and being non-judgmental, I wonder if you had any thoughts about the different kinds of relationships that people are trying to make work for themselves. I think that what I do is I help couples have difficult conversations about all kinds of things. I help them be accountable, take responsibility, and be empathic. And when it comes to sexuality, when it comes to monogamy, it's no different. We are dealing with concepts that have changed meanings completely. I mean, monogamy used to be one person for life, and today monogamy is one person at a time. And people find it totally normal when they tell you, I'm monogamous in all my relationships. I tried (laughs) telling that to my grandmother. You know, exclusivity when you are coming to marriage and this is your first partner means something very different than when you come to marriage and you've had years of sexual nomadism. And exclusivity means that you are renouncing the others. Choosing the one when you choose among three people in the village means something very different than when you're online choosing among a thousand people. And the one becomes the one for whom you're willing to delete the apps. So we are in a very new landscape. We are looking for soulmates. We are basically conflating the spiritual and the relational. We are looking to romantic love to bring us what once we looked for in religion. And we want our relationships to be perfect. Couples have never experienced more pressure to do well, to be happy, to be perfect. And today, parents the same for that matter. So people are constantly feeling not good enough. Not good enough because everybody wants them to be perfect and happy. And and this is part of the consumer society in which we live, and relationships are part of that same culture. Monogamy, that conversation in most relationships is assumed, because once you have found the one and only, you shouldn't be wanting or be interested in anybody else anymore. So what we realize today is like gay couples have done for years. Monogamy needs to be negotiated. Couples need conversations about their boundaries, about their relational arrangements about the difference between loyalty and fidelity, about their erotic space. And most of the time, couples don't talk about it until they have a crisis. It's the crisis of affairs that often propels people to discuss these things. And I think Dan is not a therapist. He's a, he's a columnist, and he brings his personal life and his opinion in the conversation. He's very clear about that. I have never had to advocate for any single model. I'm there to advocate for people to deal with their relationships with dignity, with responsibility, and with respect. And then from there, they will make the choices that they, that they will make. Some choices they make are completely different than anything I would ever consider. My job is to put myself at the service of the people that I'm trying to help and not infuse my biases, my fears, my experiences into the quests of others. And that's the art of doing therapy. It has always been the case like that, especially couples therapy. That's very well said. So Esther, I want to thank you. This has been so fun and interesting to chat with you. Thanks so much, Esther. Thank you. My pleasure. All right. Thank you, Patty, for that wonderful interview. And thank you very much to Esther Perel for joining us today. I really enjoyed hearing the interview. I always enjoy hearing her and all of her takes on such important matters. So also I wanted to, we wanted to note that she mentioned Doug Braun Harvey during her interview and how much she appreciates his work and his perspective on sexual health. And uh, excited to say that if you haven't, if you've missed it and you haven't heard, we have two episodes that we broke up a, a very in-depth interview with Deborah and Harvey into two episodes on the principles of sexual health and sexual vitality. So if you enjoyed today's episode, you will likely really appreciate hearing his perspective. 
and remind listeners that Esther's book, The State of Affairs, Rethinking Infidelity, has come out this month. So we will have that and all of the references in our show notes. When I ask the listeners today, too, we really appreciate hearing from you. Would appreciate any kind of comments, feedbacks that you want to throw our way. Also, take the time to join our Facebook page. If you do that, you can really be part of the community, join the conversation, as well as uh, hear of any upcoming events. All right. Thank you for joining us, and I'll see you around the bend. Therapist Uncensored is Ann Kelly and Sue Marriott. This podcast is edited by Jack Anderson.